Hello everyone, Lee Blackall back talking with Liz Pascoe and Brian Donnell at La Trobe University uh, School of Nursing and uh, we're going to be talking about their very experienced um, road tr trodden so far, developing a fully online um, couple of subjects in a Master of Nursing uh, called uh, a, a subject called breast care or specialising on breast care and the other specialising on cancer palliative care. Uh, I've probably done a bad job at describing that context, Liz. Could you go take us back over that context you were just saying before we hit broadcast, giving us the, the picture of the various degrees and certificates that these fit into, please? Surely. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, may I just start before I commence that I'm actually physically located in a hospital and we have a tannoy system here which um, we are prevented from turning down so um, everything including resuscitation calls and people parking in the wrong spot uh, comes through my office and so um, uh, I will probably suddenly uh, be talking, I'll have to hit the mute button in order to stop those calls coming through no the, the system and you can hear them. So um, yes, uh, about the, the two courses that I coordinate, um, the Master of Nursing in Breast Care and the Master of Nursing Cancer Palliative Care. Um, these courses have existed for some years now, I think about um, 12 years, um, but uh, I've taken the responsibility for them in 2009. They have always been online um, distance education courses, but uh, and so the materials that were developed for them were uh, they evolved as well. They were origi originally all hard copy, so mountains of information was physically posted to students. Um, it was then evolved into putting information onto CDs, which was much easier, and posted to students. But in 2013, a decision was made um, within the School of Nursing Midwifery to review our master's uh, program and at the same time, review, the review uh, included in the review was the decision to make the, uh, the suite of uh, courses that we provide all predominantly online delivery. And so that was a, a major change. Well, before that, people were doing various things, and people uh, people coordinating various the courses are still doing um, a diversity of things. But that's more to do with the nature of the the courses that they uh, coordinate and where they're located. So. To give you an example, the intensive care course um, that's uh, conducted at one of the uh, big teaching hospitals in Melbourne. The students actually physically work in the intensive care unit and the clinical coordinator is actually physically located in the hospital. So they actually go and see them and they can deliver lectures and um, but also provide online resources. With my both my courses, the students are from uh, all across Australia and from New Zealand and so they're not from a given hospital or location which meant that I had to develop the content to be absolutely 100% uh, for online delivery. So this was a, a big challenge certainly for me. Um, I'd kind of partially gone down that path but not really totally embraced it and so um, I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a particularly um, wizzo techno person and I think probably most of my colleagues feel a, a bit the same and so uh, hence uh, hence the, 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 the mighty Brian uh, coming into this picture. Over to you Brian. So in all of this, uh, did your role kick in in 2013 this year or have you been in the background while it was making this more gradual transition to an online delivery? Um, I've been in the background for this particular project. Uh, I kicked in probably about October, November last year, I would say, so 2012, yeah, when the, the new master's curriculum was fin had been developed and the, the um, streams within it were being developed mm. by the academics. So the content was being added to the LMS. That's basically where I came in to, to, advise, to, to, to advise how to um, build that content into the new LMS on Moodle. Prior okay, to that, so it's been a different platform. Oh, I see. And prior to that, when it was a different platform, was the role the same? You were helping produce content, locate content, uh, simply advise on the both, uh, getting it into the LMS, all of the above? Uh, I was, but the previous curriculum, I hadn't been around for that one to be developed, so I was just coming up the rear on that one. 
and previously had a whole bunch of content as in terms of media being developed or was it taking the old print formats, the folders that there's mentioned, taking them into an online? Uh, there had been media developed beforehand with Liz's course in particular. She said there were the, um, CDs which I believe had the videos on them and there were videos that we've used in the new uh, subjects which were on the existing online system within the university. Okay. So we just pulled them across into the LMS. And so you, not only with the content, you also made sure that the learning management system now in Moodle uh, functions well and you also help with the web conferencing system, uh, currently Blackboard Collaborate. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it's, that support's ongoing, obviously, because the, the subjects have started in semester one this year. There have been a few glitches that we've had to um, fix up along the way, so I can't say it was all completely smooth sailing, but it has, it has turned out quite well. What about some of the other feature functional stuff that uh, Latrobe has, the Echo 360 lecture recording system and all that? Does, does this particular program uh, or subject use any of those features? Uh, being completely online, there's no in-venue recordings that the, that the Echo system um, caters for, although it could if there were, obviously. Uh, and the, I think Liz has been using Collaborate rather than recording lectures, so it's it's all inclusive with the students. You can record those and um, have them available on the LMS, you know, in okay. lieu of actually having pre-recorded lectures. Okay. Liz, don't forget you're on mute, so you'll have to unmute. Uh, but this question is to you. Just getting a bit more of an understanding of um, how this looks to people in the receiving end, or the students, so to speak. Are they, they are practicing professionals by and large, or are they recent graduates moving into postgraduate study? Are they both? And you've already mentioned that um, they come from a dispersed range of areas, Australia and New Zealand. How do they come to discover the course? Do, is it under their own steam that they search for a course and find it, or do they have some sort of system in their hospital that directs them to available professional development programs? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Lee. Um, a number of a number of ways that the students come to these courses. Um, they are all registered nurses, and in fact, they cannot undertake these courses unless they are um, current practicing registered nurses. Division one nurses. We have two levels, Division one and Division two, and these nurses must be uh, registered Division one nurses currently practicing. Um, how they uh, hear about the course, um, uh, they go looking, but I have they go to conferences, they talk to each other. Um, a lot of it, I have to say, is word of mouth. Um, I get phone calls and emails saying that you know somebody's told them about this course and they'd like to find out more about it. Uh, and so that that's how people come uh, to to the course itself. Who they are, they're very diverse. I've got. Uh, uh, younger ones who've uh, perhaps finished uh, and their their um, undergraduate degree and they've worked for about three or four years and now they're wanting to uh, gain their knowledge and expertise about a particular specialism such as cancer palliative care or breast care mm -hmm. and um, so they they are they are one group of people um, another group of people the light's just gone on he's going to have to turn it on again um, <laughs> uh, yeah and the other group of people are ones who've been nursing for a very, very, very long time. And um, it is it is challenging when I've got such diversity of, of mm. people. I mean, I you know, I have rather, fr I, I would say, um, slightly anxious phone calls from a number of students who say to me, Liz, I haven't studied for 30 years and I want to give it a go, but I'm not quite sure if I'm going to make it. And so that's that's been a challenge for me, that part of it. But what's also been a challenge has been the distance education. So here I've got people who've come from systems where they are used to, you know, rocking up to a classroom and there's a lecturer standing at the front um, to a system where they are basically uh, self-driven and self-motivated. Uh, and and there is no teacher standing at the front of the room. Um, and added to that, for a lot of them, they're not familiar with technology. They haven't studied for many many years. And you know the idea of even pushing the computer on is um, a fairly daunting process, let alone using Blackboard Collaborate. So Brian has been fantastic in supporting me to to 
to pr provide information to these students. I mean, even the younger ones who I, I would say, are, you know, they're not unfamiliar with computers, they still may not be familiar with these kinds of technologies. And so providing them with uh, simple, easy to use information is, is quite paramount if I want to maximize um, the connections I make with them. So Brian's put a lot of work into developing really, uh, really simple and user-friendly information to help them to navigate their way to Blackboard Collaborate, etc. Brian, um, I'll put you on the spot a bit. Uh, would you be able to share your screen and show us anything of that from where you are? or I can. Okay, while you're working that out, um, that's that screen share button on the left. Uh, Liz, how many students do you normally enroll in a uh, subject instance? Um, they're not large numbers because it is a specialism. Um, the, yeah. the thing about postgraduate education as well is that people are making decisions about what they choose to spend their hard-earned money on um, and, you know, mortgages and family and uh, certainly eat up their, their funds. So I probably get um, anything between um, about 15 and 24 per, per course. Yeah, okay. No, that's not too bad at all. I mean, I can understand if you're taking phone calls and everything, that will soon stretch your time out and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And what about the, is there, are there enough similarities, and I suppose there would be between a New Zealand health sector context and what they need to have to practice as nurses? Are they, are they identical in Australia so that you don't have to negotiate any of that meaning-making going into the subject? Yes, very much so. Um, that side of things, the content side, is not not such a dramatic thing because um, in nursing there are uh, you know things like anatomy and physiology you have to learn. All it's doing is taking it a step further into a, a specialism and and just you know providing more depth and breadth you know in that specialist area. And nursing care is based on you know, very fundamental things and, but then it's saying, well, you know, let's look at these groups of people and let's look at some of the unique issues, nursing care issues or medical treatment issues that are facing them. So it's, it's, it's really focusing it. Um, yeah, I understand. Uh, what, but what, I mean, apart from the manageable numbers, why is it only focusing on Australia and New Zealand? I mean, other English speaking countries, non-English speaking countries, uh, apart from the managing, managing numbers, why is it we're not no, no, it's open to, um, now that it's completely online, it is open to um, uh, students from other countries. Um, they they um, provided that they can satisfy the requirements for a current practicing registered nurse, um, but also they have to be working in a in a related area too. Okay. So if they if they can, you know, provide that um, information then then they're able to do the courses okay. and because they're completely online now it makes it much easier yes uh, Brian's got his screen on so let's have a look uh, Brian we're looking at the learning management system so uh, talk, talk us through what the some of the techniques and methods you've used with Liz here yep so this is uh, one of the subjects one of our masters of nursing um, course subjects NSM for foundations a so you can see just here there's the uh, the 14, I think it's 14, there may be only 13 on there, but 14 uh, different um, streams that run within this subject. So I've logged myself in as student mode mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I've am i set myself up so that I'm basically just in the in Liz's cancer and palliative care okay. subject. So that's basically all that I see. So um, just to clarify, I... that, that uh, box at the top you pointed with the 14 or so different subjects, that's a persistent navigation to going across the whole course there. And yeah, just that's more, the, okay. the students do see this, but um, it's yeah. more for staff. The, okay. um, the links here are more for staff so that they can get directly to their subject. If I showed this to you in, um, in staff mode, yeah. uh, it's a lot more complicated because obviously we have uh, these topic blocks for each one of the the stream, so it, it yeah. does get a little bit um, a little bit complicated. No worries. So in student mode, they they basically just presented with their uh, their streams, resources, and learning modules, uh, and also how the subject works. Everybody gets all of the students get that. So there's some right. So that's the stuff that Liz was talking about. Those important help documents on how to get into the uh, collaborate system and 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 the like. 
yeah, it is in there. It's also in in Liz's um, resources folder as well. We've we've put it in both at this stage, just so that there's no chance that anyone can miss it. <laughs> so yeah, it's been okay. working well so far. Okay. Uh, so if we go into the second topic block, uh, we've got a few resources down through here. Uh, now, in particular, we're looking at the the Blackboard. Instructions. So I've basically made a book. Um, a lot of this content was in here previously, uh, not as a book and maybe not up to date. So I can't claim that it's all my own. <laughs> I have copied and pasted it, a lot of it from the um, the black blackboard themselves. Have yeah, a good, I was going to ask about what a good repository that. of information, but it's it's vast to say the least. It's quite difficult to to find, um, you know, simple answers to simple questions. So I've basically put this together as the the short way for all of the the students to get onto Blackboard Collaborate okay, uh, no, without I've having to go through taking, all those details. I notice you're taking sorry to interrupt you. But I'm noticing you're taking the method is text and screen dumps with yeah. um, numbered numbered featuring in there. Why did you choose to do that and not make a screen recording? Our screen recording is on the cards. It's just we've been quite right. busy this year, so we haven't done one of those yet. Uh, the reason that I chose to do this was because it was it's already been done. And it was available oh, on Google from somebody oh, else. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, um, that's why that one's been done that way. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Obviously. Well, just while you've got you on sc screen share, um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to push you a little bit there, Brian. It's unfair of me. We're just running a little bit short on time now. But I, I just wanted to go back to how do students find the subject? I mean, is there a presence on the um, Latrobe website for this course and the subjects in it, or? I mean, it might be just the word of mouth, but I'm just wondering if there is anything on the website that you know. Obviously, this is prior to them becoming students. You mean? Yes. Or sorry. Once they, yes. Because once they yes. are a student, they log into the LMS and they're. No, they're that's right. There. No, that's prior prior to becoming a student. Um, prior to becoming a student, definitely word of mouth. Uh, there's we were at the. Sorry, I'm not in marketing, so I don't know all of the details. But yeah, uh, we okay. go to the the different nursing expos. We have our open day. Yeah. Uh, no, so sorry, we, I've got a bit of a presence. Spot there. No, that's okay. okay. We've got a bit of a presence out there. I can show you the um, the website should have. Uh, where are we? Courses. Again, this part of the online system is not mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if they looked up, for example, nursing. Actually, and postgraduate. Undergraduate. Yep, postgraduate. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liz. I also noticed that nursing has a bit of a professional development profile on the faculty pages. I thought maybe it was mentioned there, but this is a good way to go about it, searching generally. Yeah, it comes up in Google searches as well. Yeah, but, okay. Uh, since you asked the question, <laughs> I just thought I'd give you a, a rundown of where most yeah. of the content is online. Yeah, that's, right. that's correct, yeah. The Master of Nursing. Mm. So most of the info is yeah, in there. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Is there anything else you'd throw in um, on this particular example uh, on some method you're using to help th help people through this process or some advice you might give for um, new staff or somebody coming into this space? So on the staff side? Staff um, or students, but primarily staff. We're thinking about others in the faculty who may want to develop a fully online course. The developing, uh, I just invite staff to, to come and see me about it, discuss what their needs are. Yep. Um, try to fit it to a, you know, a sort of uh, a template of yep. how we've done things in the past, but we can change on that if there are, you know, circumstances that need specific um, uh, designs for them to work properly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no it's worries. more, Thanks. Yeah, it's more of a discussion to start off with, then we can get down into mm -hmm. the the technical side of it. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Don't forget to unshare your screen so we can s yeah. see your lovely lit studio, by the way. I'd uh, yeah. quite envious <laughs> of that. <laughs> we had it painted last year, so I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder if we could even pull off a green screen here in uh, Google+, Plus, get that green screen back and replace it. I don't know. Uh, Liz, um, we, we, we need to finish up. So I'm wondering if there was any advice you were to give staff who are newly coming into this space. They might be tr attempting straight off like you did, a fully online course, or they might be going for a more blended style where uh, they do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. What would what would you say? 
Um, well, I think there are, there are two important things that I found with uh, students who are doing distance education, which is what my courses are. And I think the, um, the information that's uh, attached to this interview um, points to those, those two key areas. The first one is that students who are studying by distance education um, express a sense of feeling isolated, um, lonely. I remember a, a quote I've often used from one of the students is that it's lonely out here in the desert. And uh, you know, this is one of my students who was studying out and out beyond Broken Hill. And um, I think that's important to really uh, recognise and acknowledge that that um, they, these students do feel isolated, and that uh, it's very important to maintain an ongoing uh, communication with them. So not just at the beginning, hi, you know, lovely to meet you, and then basically it's a, a wall of silence thereafter. It's constantly sending out information or just uh, some sort of reaching out to communicate with them because a lot of them are very nervous about uh, wanting to contact me about discussing their assignments. They've come from all sorts of backgrounds which may have been that you know you're not allowed to talk to your lecturer about anything you're supposed to get on with it by yourself and they're not allowed to seek help so I, I do spend a great deal of time and I think that's very important if you're wanting to provide real quality to your students I think the other the other important thing is that how it's very important to keep the messages clear and simple um, one of the things that Brian didn't show you, which I actually would quite like to get him to show you if, if there is time. Um, Brian has advised that advised me when I, I do uh, talk a lot to Brian about what's the best way to proceed with these things, and he advised that uh, the information should be presented online in, in the book format because apart from death by scrolling, um, it, it really provides a consistency in the way the the message or the information is delivered to the students. So there's no confusion on their part about, well, hang on a minute, what, what's going on here and why is that different to that? And I'll have to ring Liz and find out why that's different to that. If all of those sorts of things are removed, it, it calms the student down, it, it makes them feel secure that there is everything's orderly, it's logical, they don't have to get panicking about, well, why is this different? Does that mean that there's something more meaningful happening here that I should know about and I don't know what it is and I've got to find out? So. The more you keep things simple, um, uh, the message simple, that there is consistency in the way that the message is delivered. I think that's that's also very powerful. And so I was certainly grateful to Brian for suggesting the book format delivery because it sets it up. And, and talking to one of my other colleagues who's also in heavily involved in online delivery, um, we, we decided on a, a way we would use the book format as well to maintain a, a real consistency in the way the information is delivered to the students. So I think they're my two main messages. Um, appreciate that these students feel very isolated and you must maintain uh, regular ongoing communication. Realise that they can't keep they, they often haven't got the time or don't feel inclined to check things, so make sure that information is clear and, and, and consistent and there's no sense of causing any confusion about why things might look different. Mm -hmm. That's it, really. Thank you very much, Liz. I think they're wise words, I'd concur. Brian, uh, can we see your video again to say our goodbyes and apologies to the recording and the viewer for uh, a portion of Liz's um, summing up there where I had the camera focused on Brian <laughs> while Liz was talking. Sorry about that. But we made up for it in the end. Um, Liz Pascoe, thanks very much for joining us. So you'll be available on the 1st of November for the face-to-face -face panel discussion about this um, um, concept of distributed professional learning. Brian, did we confirm whether you'd also be available at that panel discussion? I haven't responded to that email yet, but yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Brian and Liz. Uh, thanks very much for being available and jumping through the hoops to come on to Google Hangouts for this interview. Uh, stay on the line there. I'll just finish the broadcast and um, thank you personally.